No idea. <laughs> oh, well, during this difficult and challenging time. This is the first in a new series of webinars for the Nine Goth Square PI team. Uh, and we've got three more planned in the next three weeks. We'll be sending topics uh, and details of those shortly. In a few moments, I'll be introducing you to our, our two speakers for today. Uh, but just by way of housekeeping, if you want to ask any questions to the speakers, there is a Q&A function on the Zoom and you can ask a question there or you can private message me through Zoom uh, and I'll be able to put questions to them if we have time at the end of the session. Whilst our, our physical building is currently closed, the, the PI team are very busy upping and running as usual. And if you've got any questions or queries generally about instructions, please either be in touch with the clerks in the usual way, or again, you can send me a message. Uh, and finally, before we move on to our speakers, uh, as mentioned, we hope to have uh, at least another three of these webinars in the coming weeks. So if you do have any, any feedback from today, please be in touch with Mona, our marketing director, or me, um, you can email us or, or in the usual way or use the message facility on this call. Um, I'm sorry we can't be doing this in person, especially as at the end of most Nine Golf seminars, uh, we always have a drink in the bar. But we will hopefully see all of you very soon. So today we have two talks. The first is going to be from Simon Brindle, who will speak about using the Ogden tables. Uh, and secondly, from Laura Elfield, who will give us an update, uh, Express ADR. Um, Simon first. Simon is one of our leading juniors, part of our mediation team, a specialist in personal injury and in clinical negligence. And I'm very pleased and looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. Simon, over to you. Hi, everybody. It's very, very strange just talking to a computer screen. Um, I hope you can hear me OK. And I'm going to launch into the Ogden tables in about 20 minutes. So let's try and share this screen and see where we go. Hopefully you should see my screen and it, hopefully the slide presentation should start. So I'm going to talk to you about the Ogden tables in 20 minutes, but before I do so, a very quick and shameless plug for the third edition of the April Guide to Catastrophic Injury Claims. You see the lovely picture on the bottom left hand side. Um, despite what I've written in that, there's an awful lot of very useful and comprehensive uh, cover of the guide to personal injury claims, it, catastrophic nature. Anyway, moving on. Um, the Ogden Tables. I'm going to take it as read that you know what the Ogden Tables are. You know that we use them to find the multipliers for establishing future losses for a claimant. We use those multipliers and apply them to multiply cans, so the claimant's annual loss, and we find the multipliers for however long the claimant is going to suffer that loss for. I take it as read also that you know we use a discount rate when considering those uh, multipliers of minus 2.5%. Uh, and I'll take it as read that you've seen the Ogden tables. But if you haven't, just as a brief reminder, also there are 28 of them. The first two deal with life multipliers, so multipliers for someone's life. The tables 3 to 14 deal with multipliers to a certain age, usually expressed as a retirement age. 15 to 26 deal with multipliers from a certain age. Uh, seven, 27 and 28 are slightly different. 27 deals with multipliers for a deferred payment and 28 deals with multipliers for a fixed time. I will come back to all of these and just doing that by way of overview. So, um, the reason we use the Ogden tables is because they allow for both the discount rate and for the, the risk of mortality to a claimant. So tables one to 28 allow for the fact that your claimant could die, could live longer than the physical life expectancy and give a broad brush assessment as to the risk of mortality and quantifying future losses. Tables 27 to 28 do not. It's quite important just to remember that when you're coming to think about which table you're going to use. And of course, the tables use a discount rate, and I'm sure you are familiar with the Ferrari about the discount rate over the recent years. We have to use a minus, two, uh, minus 0.25% discount rate. So in other words, we are allowing for the fact that the money you get now for a, the, for a loss in a long pit time ahead will actually lose value in real terms uh, going forward. And that's why it's a negative discount rate. Okay. 
that's my brief introduction. I'm going to talk to you about the uh, four main ways we use the object tables in brief overview. I will start with life expectancy. Um, the three tables you're going to need there. Table one and two are the main one. Table one is life expectancy for males. Table two is life expectancy for females. But you may need to use table 28 if you have someone with a fixed expectation of life rather than a statistical expectation of life or one that has been reduced. Um, and on the left we have Spike Milligan's gravestone. Actually, his, his epitaph in Gaelic is I told you I was ill. So going through how we quantify or find the right multiplier for uh, life expectancy is easier done by demonstration. So let's take an example. To find somebody's statistical life expectancy, you need their age. It's quite straightforward. So my example of a female age 24. We go to table two, that's the table that deals with life expectancy for females. And if we use the discount rate of 0%, you'll find out that person's statistical life expectancy. But in order to find the multiplier that we use for quantifying damages, we have to use the column for minus 0.25%. That gives us the one we need. So here are the tables. And I've highlighted, hopefully you can see my mouse pointer moving around the relevant bits of it for us. So table two up there, pecuniary loss, uh, sorry, multiplier to pecuniary loss for life for females. That's the heading straight forward. On the left hand side, we see the age at the date of trial. So we're looking for our claimant's age in this column. We've got 24 here. We then need to go across this line to find the discount rate we are applying, or well, 0% gives us the claimant's life expectancy. So someone who is 24 has an expectation of a further 66.57 years of life. As I said, because we are dealing with awards of damages now that in real terms lose value, we don't use that one. We use the minus 0.25% column and that gives us a multiplier of 72.72. .72. So if you had a claimant who was suffering a loss for a life of say a hundred pounds per annum, you would take a hundred pounds and you would multiply it by 72.72 to find what the loss is. Hopefully you got all that. Now, if though you have someone who a judge has said, I think this person is going to live for another X years, then you don't use the statistical life expectancy multipliers because the judge has determined the claimant's life expectancy. They have a fixed expectation of life. So if you have someone, say, who has a 24 years left to live, then you don't use table one or two, you use table 28. And uh, same thing, zero gives you the, the number of years and the minus 0.25% uh, column gives you the multiplier that's appropriate. So again, by way of example, here we have table 28, multiplier to be lost for a term certain. We go down the term rather than age at trial. We're now looking at term to number of years. Go down to that, we have 24. And across to the two columns, 0%, you can see it's 24, so it's the, number, the same number, but the uh, column for minus 2.75 over 24 period, 24 year period is 24.74. So that essentially is simply allowing for the fact you're getting all of the money now for losses that will accrue periodically over a 24 year period. It does not allow for a risk to life expectancy. So how do you know which one to use or which set of tables to use? It's quite straightforward, I think. If you have somebody's life expectancy that is reduced by a period, then you use table one or two. Table one if it's a man, table two if it's a uh, woman. If you have someone's life expectancy that is reduced to a period, then you use table 28. So um, if you've got uh, someone whose life expectancy is reduced to five years, then you simply go back to table 28 you find table uh, term five in the left-hand column and the right multiplier is under the minus 0.25% uh, heading of 5.3. But if you have someone whose statistical life expectancy is reduced by five years, then you go to the table one or two, so if it's a female table two, and you add to their age for the purposes of looking at the multiplier, the reduction. So if their life expectancy has been reduced by five years and they're 24, then you look for the, the multiplier for someone who is 29. So here we are, as an example, 
table two, that there is 29. And so the multiplier for someone who is age 24, but who has a reduced life expectancy by five years is 61.11 years, as opposed to the 66.57 years. So it's not a straight reduction of five. Uh, and likewise, the reduction for uh, the multiplier we actually use to quantify the loss is not a straight reduction by five. It's 66.3 rather than 72.72. So that's all I want to say about loss of uh, uh, life expectancy or having life expectancy. Now let's talk about loss of earnings. So, as you know, when calculating loss of earnings, what you're doing is essentially a two-stage calculation. You first calculate what the claimant would have earned had the accident not occurred, and then you calculate what they are now capable of earning or will earn with the uh, ongoing disability, if, if there are any, or their residual earning capacity. Now, the Ogden tables give us multipliers, as I say, for a two fixed age, so to 50, to 55, 60, 65. Uh, 70, 75 as well. What they don't do though is allow for contingencies other than mortality or retirement at ages other than 60, 65, 70, 75, or all those, those quite nice neat numbers. I'll talk to you about both of those aspects in a moment, but first let's just deal with a bog standard loss of earnings calculation. So you have a claimant age 24, she's retiring at 65. You go to table 10, that deals with the multipliers to age 65. You look at the minus 0.25% column and you get the answer of 42.47. If you don't believe me, there it is. That's table 10, pension age 65, minus 0.25% column, and there is the multiplier. That's fine, but that's not the right multiplier to use when quantifying loss of earnings because you've got to allow for contingencies other than mortality. As I said at the start, the Ogden tables allow for the fact that you could die in, in the intervening period. What they don't allow for is the fact that you could find yourself out of work or, or reduced earnings uh, during that period too. And so what the Ogden working party has come up with is tables A to D that are in the explanatory notes that give you another multiplier to apply to the multiplier to take a mathematical account of the contingencies of, of the risks. And what they do is they allow for the claimant's gender and the fact, quite frankly, that still in our society, women bear the brunt of childcare responsibilities or taking time off to look after uh, elderly or sick relatives. And so they are less likely to be able to maintain employment at, at their full capacity for the rest of the entirety of their working career. It also allows for things like disability status. Again, people who are disabled in the meaning of the Equality Act uh, are less likely than able-bodied people to obtain and sustain work for the entirety of their working career. It allows for age, uh, it allows for employment status, whether you're employed or not, rather than necessarily the job you're doing, but also for educational attainment. And in broad terms, the better educated you are, the more likely you are to find and sustain employment. And what they, what the Ogden Working Party have done is produce, as I say, these four tables, A to D. Here is table C, which deals with females and who are not disabled. Table D deals with females who are disabled. Tables A and B deal with men uh, not disabled and disabled similarly. And what the table does is we have lots of earnings to pension age 60. There's none other than 60 or 65 or, or uh, 70. So you just deal with, you have to use table 60. And then it puts age down the left-hand side and they're brackets of age rather than uh, uh, individual ages. So our claimant who's 24 will fall within this bracket, 20 to 24. It then separates categories into employed and not employed. Basically on the principle that if you've got a job, you're more likely to keep one uh, and then if you've not got a job, you're not likely to be out of employment for the rest of your working career. And then splits those two categories even further into three subcategories, which are based on educational attainment. So D stands for degree level uh, education, GEA is GCC or A level uh, education, and O is no education. And it's important to remember that whilst they're 
express the degree level GCSEs or, or not, uh, equivalent education will also count. So on the job training to degree level, even if you don't actually have a degree, would put you in this column. So our claimant, uh, who's 24, would be somewhere on here, depending upon whether she was disabled or not. If she's not disabled, if she's disabled, then we'll look at table D. If she's not disabled, we're in table C. If she's employed, we're along this side. If she's not employed, we're on this side. And where we are depends upon how, how far she got along her educational career. So let's plug that into our example. We've got a female, she's 24, she's retiring at 65. She's educated degree level, and she was employed at the time of the accident, earning £35,000 a year. She's now, as a result of the accident, unemployed, but has a residual earning capacity of £25,000, and she's not disabled. We start by working out what she would have earned had the accident not occurred. And we work that out based on a lump sum payable to her now that allows for the fact that she could drop dead in that intervening period or that she could have had time off work for other reasons. So we take her income, that becomes the multiplicand of £35,000, and we multiply that by the multiplier, which we find by looking at table 10, which is to retirement at 65, and that gives us the 42.47 that we've already seen. And we apply to that the table C multiplier of 0.89, which is the one for someone who is in employment and who was educated at degree level. And we get a, a multiplier, a final multiplier of 37.8. We multiply the 35,000 by the 37.8 and we get a grand total of 1.3 odd million pounds, which is essentially her earning potential of the rest of her working career expressed as a lump sum payable to her now, taking account of all the, the contingencies that would have existed. From that, we take away her residual earning capacity. Now, in my example, she can now only earn £25,000. The multiplier to 65 remains the same, because you can still re re work to 65, but the contingencies other than mortality multiplier has reduced from the 8.9 to 8.4, sorry, from the 0.89 to the 0.84 because she's not employed. And so the overall multiplier is reduced too. Apply that to the £25,000 and you get a total of £892,000 and to find the loss you take away 1.3, uh, sorry, the one, the 892 from the 1.3 million and you end up with £431,000, which if you go back she was losing £10,000 a year essentially over a 41 pe year period. The total is slightly more than 41 times £10,000 even though we've lost uh, over 10% for contingencies other than mortality. And it's higher because she's getting all the money now, and in real terms, that money will lose value over the 41 uh, year period it's designed to compensate her for. Things change though if your claimant is disabled, and that is why disability status is quite an important aspect of uh, personal injury claims. If your claimant is disabled, we don't look when we're coming to the residual earning capacity because you other mortality multipliers at table C, we look at table D. And so changing nothing else other than disabled status, the recommended multiplier in table D, if she's unemployed but still educated degree level because her, her education hasn't changed, goes down to 0.58. And so the overall multiplier drops down to 24.63 and the total income is 615 or 616,000 pounds. And so her, uh, sorry, and there we have table D, just in case you need to see it. So the multipliers have gone down because of the disabled status. Nothing else has changed. The overall loss then is 1.3 million minus 616,000, which is 707,000 pounds. It's important to remember, though, that these multipliers in table C, D, A, and B are not set in stone. They are guidelines at best, and judges are want to tinker with them because they may feel that a reduction of 42% uh, of the value of someone's residual learning capacity is too much reduction if their disability is not as great as perhaps others might suffer from but they're a very good start and you should be pleading those if nothing else. Now, 
I promised you I would get to other retirement ages and it becomes a math quiz at this point. The Ogden Working Party suggests that if you're trying to find a multiplier that falls between the two, uh, any two ones that they have given, so for this claimant between 65 and 70, what you have to do is interpolate, interpolate between the two tables. So you have to find a multiplier in the table to 65, you have to find a multiplier to the table to 70, and then do this uh, rather convoluted calculation to precisely work out what it is that the multiplier should be. I'm not suggesting we go through that in any detail, but what I'm going to do is suggest to you perhaps a quicker method that gets you close enough, but if not quite right. So a close estimate might be simply taking your claimant's age and reducing it uh, for the purposes of finding the multiplier by the number of years extra she would have to work in the table that you are using. So in my example, I put on the, on the slides for you. If the claimant's going to retire at 68, that's what R equals, and she's now 42, you could use table 10, which gives you the multipliers to 65, and simply reduce her age by three to say, well, she's going to work another three years, so I'll reduce her age by three, and that gives you a multiplier of 26.28. That's actually too high, but it's fairly close to where it is. If you want to be a bit more precise, you can do the same for the table above and say, well, okay, if I use the table to 70, she's going to actually work two years less than in retirement at 70. So I'll add two years to her age for the purposes of finding the multiplier. So instead of finding the multiplier to 70 from age 42, I'll use the multiplier from age 44. That gives you a multiplier of 25.95, which again is a little low, but it's close enough. Or if you want to be even more close of your approximation, you can add those two multipliers together and divide them by two. And what you get if you do that latter approach is pretty close to the right answer. So the proper method, the interpolation method, gives you a multiplier for someone who's 20, um, sorry, someone who's 42, of 26.08. The close estimate of adding the two together and dividing by two gives you 26.12. It's not far off. In reality, if you're drafting a schedule and you really can't be bothered with the interpolation method, I would stick with using the table for the age below that which the claimant re re retires and using uh, deducting the number of years from her age in order to find that. So using my first method here and just simply going for the 26.28 if that was the, the scenario you were using, because that will give you more than the actual appropriate answer and the defendant can then uh, argue it. Of course, if you are leading a counter schedule, you probably want to use the interpretation lesson method because that will give you the right answer. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about loss of earnings. Moving on, I want to deal very briefly with accelerated receipt. What we're talking about here is where you have a loss, but it won't be sustained for a number of years. So say you're going to have an operation and it's going to take place in 10 years time, but you're getting the debt money for that now. And if you stuck it in a bank account, it would lose money in real terms. Now, of course, the discount rate isn't set by reference to interest rates on bank accounts. It's set by rates of return that you could get on index linked government guilt. But nevertheless, it's a similar um, uh, thought process. What you need to do is allow for the fact that it's going to lose value in real terms. So you turn to page uh, table 27 and you simply find on the left hand side how many years you're deferring payment for. So in our example, 10 years time, and then you multiply the amount of money you need to spend in 10 years time by that multiplier under the minus 0.25% column. So in my example, if it costs £10,000 to uh, have surgery, then the claimant will be awarded £10,253 now to allow for the fact it will reduce in value in real terms over that 10 year period. Now that leads in nicely to the final topic I wanted to talk about, which was aids and equipment. There are two methods by which you can calculate aids and equipment claims, and it's easy to explain them by way of example than it is to talk through them uh, in theory. So the first method is the annualized sum, and this is essentially where you work out how much per annum it will cost to replace things, but if they are not going to be replaced every year, 
you divide the total cost by the replacement period. So in my example, we have a wheelchair that costs £10,000. It needs to be placed every 10 years and the need is for life. So you at trial award the claimant the cost of the wheelchair outright. So you get one ten thousand pounds. You then, for the remainder of the claimant's need, work out how much per annum that the ten thousand pounds every ten years equates to, which is a thousand pounds per annum. You multiply that a thousand pounds per annum for their life, but you take off one from the life multiplier in order to allow for that initial purchase, because otherwise. The claimant would have effectively the, the um, two costs of the chair at the outset. And you can do this calculation on all of the aids and equipment. You can simply lump them together uh, and provided you work out uh, the different annualized costs for different equipment. So if equipment needs replacing every five years, it will be a different annualized sum. But if you've done that, you can lump it all together and just do, adopt this approach. The other approach is to work out precisely how much will be paid and when and apply the appropriate table 27 multiplier to it. So it's easy to show by the example that you've got a chair that costs £10,000, you award the cost at trial so the multiplier is one and you get £10,000 for that. You're going to need another chair in 10 years so it's £10,000 in 10 years time as we saw from table 27 the multiplier for that is 1.0253, so the payment's awarded £10,253 for that loss, and so on. Whichever method you adopt, uh, I would suggest, depends upon the uh, amount that it produces. So by way of comparison, just using my examples, we have a claimant, again, at age 24. She has a statistical life expectancy of 66.57 years, as we've seen. The life multiplier, as we've already seen, is 72.72. Wheelchair cost, or the Asian equipment cost, is £10,000 every 10 years, and the needs for life. Using the annualised sum method, initial cost is £10,000. The recurring costs are £1,000 for life, but it's life minus one. So it's 71.72 rather than 72.72, and we get a subtotal there of 71,700 and a grand total of 81,720 pounds. If though you do the periodic purchases, you get a lower sum of 75,000 pounds. And that is because the claim, as it were, ends at age 60, because the claimant will die before she needs another sorry, not at age 60, at year 60, the claimant will die before she needs another wheelchair, whereas on the annualised sum, she's getting £1,000 for six years after that time. So, in my example, the periodic payment, uh, periodic purchases calculation comes out less, and so you may want to, if you're representing the claimant, claim the annualised sum method. But it's not always the case it turns out like that. So for things like prosthetics or replacement legs, the annual sum, there's, the annual sum is uh, different depending on the type of leg and what part of the replacement cycle you're in. So, for example, a, a leg can cost upwards of sixty thousand pounds and replaced every six years, but every year in between those, that six years, there are maintenance costs or replacement knee costs or cosmesis costs, and so simply lumping the entire cost over that six year period and annualizing it can often result in a lower sum than claiming individual costs each and every year for the remainder of the claimant's life. All right, I've probably gone over uh, the 20 minutes I promised to do this in, so I'll leave it there. If there are any questions, please ask them and we'll hang around afterwards uh, to answer them. But thanks for your time and I hope it was relatively painless. Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you very much indeed. And uh, as Simon said, if anybody wants to put any questions, please do either put them on the Q and A, um, or, or indeed we can we can hang around afterwards uh, when Laura's talk is over. Um, thanks, Simon. If I can now pass over to Laura Elfield. Uh, Laura is a qualified mediator, head of our mediation team, uh, and also a key part of our personal injury, clin neg, and employment team, and is going to talk to us today about Express ADR. And give us a bit of an update. So over to you. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. Um, I am just going to try to get my slides up. Hopefully that is now all on your screens. Uh, 
Did, did that work? Mona? Um, can't see anything at the moment, Laura. Right, let me, let me try that again. Pulled them up from me, but they clearly didn't show up for you guys. How about now, Mona? No, not now. Uh, Laura, I'll share them and then you'll just say to me next slide, okay? Okay. So hello everyone, um, thank you um, for attending the Express ADR update. Um, as some of you know, I was planning this as a mediation roadshow and I was going to be coming into um, some of your offices um, to give a much longer talk. I'm glad I have the chance to speak to you this afternoon. This is actually such a fast moving area of law at the moment, but I'm sure I'll have more to say to you all um, very soon. Um, Today we are going to concentrate the time we have on two key um, matters which have uh, over the last 12 months. First is the rise of judicial early neutral evaluation and the second is um, the potential move in the direction of compulsory ADR. Um, and, and, and to start with some definitions um, what is ADR? Um, next slide, please. The um, Jackson ADR Handbook, um, I, I think we all talk about ADR, but what do I actually mean? Um, it's in its second edition, it's now wildly out of date, 2016, but I don't think the definition um, has particularly changed. Um, the term covers the full range of alternatives to litigation potentially available to resolve a civil dispute. So any option where there's a dispute between two or more parties, um, it could potentially be addressed through civil litigation and proceedings need not have been issued. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll see that there is a range of ADR techniques from those which are wholly facilitative, um, like negotiation and round table meetings and JSNs, which those of us who do um, in NEG um, and PI are very familiar with, through to mediation, which we'll be talking um, quite a lot about today. And then at the other end of the scale, we have most evaluative arbitration. And the thing which I will also be concentrating on today, judicial early neutral evaluation. That's quite a mouthful. Um, I've been trying to come up with um, some good acronyms. Today I'm going to call them GENUS, just so I don't trip over my tongue every time I talk about them. Um, and next slide, please. And the next one. So mediation, just really to talk about it by way of contrast um, to Janus, and because different considerations are likely to apply, in particular when we move to talk about compulsion, depending on what kind of ADR we're discussing. Now, mediation was the principal process considered in the CJC report on ADR. Um, this is an important report. It followed um, lots of um, working um, groups um, with a, a range of mediators, barristers, judges, um, arbitrators, um, and it reported on mediation um, that it was flexible and massively successful consistently surprises professionals and parties alike in its ability to achieve settlements where the parties appear in fact be opposed. Um, I've set out the CEDA definition for you. Those of you who do clean leg will be uh, very familiar with mediations. Um, it's a confidential, flexible process. Um, you get a neutral third party in to help the parties um, resolve their um, dispute. Um, next. Slide, please. And features of the mediation, it's a contractual process, so you engage a mediator, 
all of the terms of the mediation will be agreed. Indeed, you can agree that the parties can move to an evaluation process um, if they so consent. Um, it's managed by a trained and experienced neutral. They, uh, it, it's done well, the mediator should not direct the process, they shouldn't um, provide an opinion, they shouldn't judge, but they should instead facilitate the parties to come to their own resolution. The whole process um, is managed with consent, including whether or not to continue or settle. The whole process is confidential without prejudice. There's lots of flexibility as to outcomes, um, including non-legal outcomes, such as apologies, or I have um, uh, witnessed um, in deck mediations where, for example, the trust offers to buy a piece of equipment where, for example, breach is admitted, but not causation, and the parties go away feeling that they've gained something from the process, which perhaps litigation could have achieved. The parties attend with authority to settle, and it usually results in a formal signed agreement. But it's facilitative and very flexible. Let's contrast that with Jenna's, which I deal with in the next slide. So early mutual evaluation, this can either be private, you engage um, a, 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 an independent neutral evaluator, or what we're going to concentrate on today is court arranged judicial mediation. Now, since the 1st of October 2015, judicial case management powers expressly included power to carry out a Jenna. Um, the relevant provisions are tucked away in CPR 3.12m, which say this, the court may take any other step or make any other order for the purpose of managing the case and furthering the overriding objectives, including hearing an early neutral evaluation with the aim of helping the parties to settle the case. Um, Seals and Seals and Williams was in fact decided just before um, the, the relevant provisions came into force in the CPR. Um, but Norris, um, in that case, sings the praises of um, Jenna's over mediation, says it has the advantage that you can get an authoritative provisional judicial opinion on the merits of court evidence. So the process is particularly useful where the parties have very differing views of the prospect of success and perhaps an inadequate understanding of the risks of litigation itself. Um, in my um, case, when I attended private um, mutual evaluation, we were stuck on the issue of contrib, and it was extremely useful to have a recorder come in and give us a non-binding opinion on the issue of contrib, which then led to the resolution of that issue, so that we could get on with quantum. Go to the next slide. Now, Jenna have been sitting there in the, in the CPR since 2015, but I, I, I don't know many, if any, who've actually done one, but they are coming to the fore uh, due to the combination of the case of Lomax, which we'll come on to discuss. And then um, in March this year, we have the case of Telecom Centre in Sanderson, where Master McLeod provides guidance on the procedure for conducting Jenna um, in the QBD, um, because there's nothing about it in the CPR. If you've got a chancery case, there's already chancery guidance, so you can go to the um, appropriate guidance. This, this, this um, case relates to um, the QBD. And um, Master McLeod has sent off um, the guidance and proposed order to the authors of, of, of the Queen's Bench Guide. So we may see all of this enshrined in the updated guidance. Um, so the, the, the case sets out helpfully what a Jenna is. It's a procedure which involves a judge expressing an opinion, both positive and negative, about issues or parts of it. It's useful by the resolution of some key issues that encourage settlement a whole or parts of the case, such as my contrib issue, or where the trial time estimate or costs would be significantly reduced if parts of the case could be resolved by um, early neutral evaluation. It's confidential, and therefore the judge dealing with the early neutral evaluation will not absent agreement to try the case or deal with legal contentious applications. That's an interesting um, comment by Master McLeod, because it's difficult to see in what circumstances that the, the, the parties might agree that a judge giving an opinion could uh, deal with the case, try the case later, um, unless it was on an entirely different issue. Um, 
the outcome is normally without prejudice and non-binding unless the burden has really to be found. So uh, there's flexibility in the process. It will be interesting to see whether people uh, select particular judges to give them uh, a, a, an opinion, which means that that judge then can't make the try the case and didn't hear it from me. Um, moving on to the next slide. Malcolm Cloud said it will be for the judge to decide the form and to bring an informality of the opinion, to grab an oral opinion or something in writing to ensure for long, and to consider an appropriate time estimate for the Jenna. Um, she specifically commented that it might maybe well may well be more than half a day because the child's three died as half a day is the norm. It could example it could involve a wholly written um, hearing or a, or an oral hearing. At the end of the Jenna, the case will return to the parties and not returned in court file. And Master McLeod has also provided a generic draft order that can be adapted to other cases. And it includes provision for exchanges of evidence, meaning the court bundle, um, that the form of the opinion is within the discretion, and that the judge shall have no further involvement thereafter, again, unless the parties seek to Next slide. Leads us on nicely to how the parties to engage in ADR, which is probably what you've all um, come to hear about today, at least in terms of my talk. Next slide, please. Traditional approach um, is, is Fawzi and Milton Keynes. It's, it's an old case. Um, I'm sure we all know it well. I've set out the relevant part, um, but in essence, what the Court of Appeal said in that case is no, um, we can't compel the parties um, to engage um, in ADR. And Corsi was principally um, concerned with addiction, which again it, it considered to be the principal form of ADR. It, 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 it said that to oblige truly unwilling parties to refer their disputes to mediation would be to impose an unacceptable obstruction on the right of access to the court. Um, it seems to us likely that compulsion of ADR be regarded as a violation of Article 6. They also mentioned to say that even if they were wrong about that, it was almost impossible to have circumstances in which exercise any discretion to compel parties to um, engage in ADR. Um, the hallmark of uh, ADR procedures, they said, is that they are entered into voluntarily. Um, consequently, the court can't direct such a means that may merely encourage and so that was Halsey in 2004. On the next slide, we'll be uh, fast forward to 2013 and Lord Justice Ward, who had given the judgment in Halsey, after a particularly entrenched piece of litigation um, where he couldn't get the parties to engage in um, mediation, doubted whether he got it right in the board. He invited some bold judge to reconsider the point. Said in his frustration, you may be able to drag the horse, and you will offer a better metaphor for water, but you cannot force the wretched animal to drink. So, kind of the language, um, and even the Justice Board is, is, is inviting a reconsideration of horses. But in the meantime, what happened was that the courts moved towards encouragement um, and sanction. And on the next slide, We'll see that um, a, a, a just a brief overview. The court's role in encouraging the parties to engage in ADR set out in the overriding objectives. There are tick boxes um, in the DPs in both um, fast track and multi track claims for what they're worth. Um, the action protocols expect that the parties will consider the use of ADR prior to the issue of proceedings. Um, there's a reference to ADR in the various guides, including the Guide. And then moving towards uh, the strict approach, the undoing order becomes standard form um, asserted in all directions that the parties um, shall consider whether the case is capable of resolution by ADR um, and be prepared to justify um, the potential responsibility at the end of the trial. Next slide. Um, in terms of the SIC, um, there, since housing, 
um, and I'm here to build a refusal to participate in ADRs, and that's to an amount of unreasonable conduct to litigation, to which the court may properly respond by imposing cost sanctions. Um, Hawes is a, a, an old case, um, but um, it, it, it remains at present um, the, the cornerstone of, of, of the law in this area. Um, and in Horsley, it was said that there's no presumption in favour of ADR, but instead a non exhaustive list of factors um, is provided relevant to the question of whether a party has unreasonably refused. Um, I've set them out here um, in the time available to us. I'm, I'm not going to go through them all in detail. So to say that um, a number of them are starting to look in that state. For example, um, whether the ADR has reasonable prospects of success. In general terms, an ADR has an extremely high success rate, um, and even when it has a meritorious case, there might be an extreme case of ADR, even if it is only to narrow the issue, and there's been much commentary on Horsey. There's also been glosses on Horsey, and on the next slide, we'll see um, the chief case um, providing a gloss on Horsey and the need um, for um, greater sanctions failing to engage um, in mediation stroke ADR is PGP, where the Court of Appeal held that silence in the face of um, a serious invitation to engage in mediation amounted to unreasonable refusal. Um, and this would be the case even where the refusal might be justified by the identification of reasonable grounds. But um, contrast that with the Court of Appeals approach in Gore and Nahid, where Lord Justice Patton said, speaking to myself, I have some difficulty in accepting that the desire of a party to have its rights determined by a court of law, preference to mediation, can be said to be unreasonable conduct, particularly when, as here, those rights are ultimately implicated. So we've got slightly conflicting um, approaches to the um, issue of sanctions. And that was identified by uh, the Civil Justice Commission's final report in November uh, 2018. That report recommended that there should be a presumption in favour of ADR. It recommended that the Horsey guidelines should be reviewed and should narrow the circumstances in which it regarded as reasonable. It suggested that the presumption in favour of ADR was enshrined in order various um, rules um, and guidance, but it shy away, as I say, from compulsion. So that was the situation in November 2018, and those were the recommendations of the Civil Justice Commission. But we then come on um, 2019, Max and Max on the next slide. So Max and Max. The Court of Appeal distinguished the position of the Court-Ordered Early Mutual Evaluation, or GENAS, um, and ordered GENAS against the wishes of one party. So this is partly why I've been speaking at such length um, about um, GENAS. The Court of Appeal noted that there are no expressed words in the rule to the effect that um, an early mutual evaluation hearing can only be ordered if all parties consent. It referred to the fact that there were equivalent hearings in the family court where there was compulsory ADR and they had been outstandingly successful. The Court of Appeal noted that Horsey was concerned with whether a court could oblige the parties to submit to mediation, which differed from Jenna, which was part of the court process and didn't have access to mediation. Um, however, intriguingly, they left this hanging. The court's engagement with mediation had was decided. Um, the Court of Appeal didn't need to go there, it didn't need to decide it um, in Lomax and Lomax, so it left it hanging for another time. And perhaps the most up to date commentary on, on Lomax and Lomax is in the next slide. And that is um, the Parliament and Partners um, Whitehead, um, which was in February this year. Chapter of the High Court, Sir Jeffrey Boss, um, leans on the parties very, very heavily um, to engage in mediation. 
um, the, the, the paragraph sets out his approach nicely. He encouraged the parties to proceed to a privately arranged mediation as soon as disclosure had occurred. I mentioned that Lomax inevitably raised the question of whether the court might also require the parties to engage in mediation, despite the decision in Halsey. The result, the parties fortunately agreed to a direction for the mediation to take place after disclosure, as I have already hinted. But it's very heavy leaning and um, didn't quite go so far as directing it, um, but one wonders um, whether we might at the time. Um, so where does that leave us? Oh, well, on the next slide, um, and so obviously the whole situation is right for review. It's difficult to see how we might get um, there. Um, I, it's difficult to see that the judge might be bold enough to actually direct a mediation in the current climate. But it may be that, that, that there's an appeal on one of the other halls and principles um, might lead um, to a review of the whole. Certainly compulsory um, mediation would bring the um, UK in line with other jurisdictions, Italy, Turkey. Scotland was considering it in its proposed mediation Scotland bill. Um, there was a, a consultation on it last year which closed in November and the revised wording has been to shy away from compulsory mediation and instead of using direction of compulsory as mentioned in the context of Lomax, we already have compulsory AVR in family law, um, known as uh, MIAM, very successful. No compulsion remains the position for now in relation to mediation, just about. Where this is all going to end up, I suspect is going to be, um, as with the Civil Justice Committee report, assumption in favour um, of AVR, same in the case of um, Jenner's. Really, um, with the combination of Lomax um, and the telecoms case is going to be on the rise, so we need to be aware of it. Now, the final area that I, I said I'd talk about today, um, uh, and it's on the next slide, um, are just some tips um, for dealing with remote ADR. Um, obviously, there's, there's a stronger case than ever for trying to get our cases settled if we can. Um, these are, this is some food for thought. In fact, in the next couple of weeks, I've got a, a remote uh, JSM and I'm also uh, mediating a remote dispute. So I'll probably have some more practical hands-on experience in the next couple of weeks, but, but food for thought. If, if you've got a mediator in your case, they will probably be canvassing all of these points with you. Um, but otherwise, it's, I think all of these points need to be canvassed with counsel and um, with your client as you um, decide, first of all, is your case suitable for remote APR? If you've got a particularly vulnerable elderly client, potentially, um, it, it, they may not wish to engage in remote APR. Equally, they may be just the clients that you're not going to want to be or able to visit um, in person. Use your forum carefully, telephone or screen. Um, I had a um, court ordered pre hearing review um, earlier this week um, where the court ordered it to take place by BP conference call. Uh, the effect of that was that no one could take instructions, uh, no one could negotiate, the whole thing was recorded. The court hadn't thought it through at all, and that is the case that was now put off for a remote um, agenda. Um, telephone or screen. Um, or does your client have a screen? Does your client feel comfortable using a screen? Um, as against that, if you don't already have quite a good rapport with your client, um, is the lack of eye to eye contact such as it is virtually um, going to impede um, trust um, and impede the ability um, to, to, to seek a, a, a good resolution? If using a screen, which provider? Um, I think it's always a good a, 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 a idea if you can to practice in advance some the mediation or JSM with um, attendees if possible, certainly with the client to avoid disruption on the day, to avoid finding out that someone's camera or, or, or work. I, I think it's helpful and certainly um, when I mediate and tend to provide a brief bit of guidance on the use of the technology so someone has a quick um, consider 
ability to make most necessary to attend and keep attendees to a minimum does your client live in a house shared with other people in one to travel around the street. And final slide. Have Zoom allows you to breakout rooms so you can have private conversations with your client. Mediate them if appropriate. Um, it, 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 it may be obvious, but I think especially in what feels like an, a, a more informal uh, approach to remote uh, SDR, ensure that your clients are aware that negotiations are confidential without prejudice. Um, you may want to have a chat to them about the appropriate or um, their technology if it's they don't want to be out in their garden talking to you on the phone with any their neighbor. Um, if it's a mediation, again, the mediator would deal with this, but all need to sign up for the agreement, but you also need to consider who might be listening in to make sure that everyone who might be listening in is signed up to the confidentiality Finally, um, as we are reaching the end of an hour, um, this is a summary um, of relevance to all um, of you. We're aware of sleep, uh, keep things as brief and efficient as possible. Um, it may be that it's appropriate to do things over two sessions um, rather than one. Um, a, a, a long day of JSM is something quite different to do. Um, and finally, enjoy not having to travel. Um, I'm very happy to um, answer any questions now. Equally, I um, feel very free um, to ring. I'm very happy to talk to at the moment in the current climate or, or drop me an email. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Laura, uh, and thank you everybody for uh, attending today. Um, I I've seen a couple of questions that have been put and answered. If anybody does have any further questions, please uh, either do it now or email or, or call um, any of us or any of the team. Um, may I thank uh, on everybody's behalf, Simon and Laura, uh, both for your presentations. Uh, and also may I thank Mona, our um, head of marketing and, and Ellie, the head of the civil team clerking for dealing with the logistics and sorting out uh, the webinar today. Um, as I say, we're hopefully going to be doing uh, these in subsequent weeks and we will send out details um, over the course of, of, of the next few days as to next week uh, and indeed uh, future seminars. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for attending. I, I hope that we will be able to see you soon in terms um, both on our webinars but also um, I would say Nine Golf Square, but hopefully in our new premises in Norwich Street, uh, you'll all be very welcome. Have a good afternoon and most importantly, stay well. Thank you very much indeed.